singing today. I don't know if I've ever sang that rendition of sleep, easy living uh, song, but, but whatever it is, it's pretty darn good. I like that. If you have a Bible, I would ask you to open them to the gospel, uh, to the, oh, am I on? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, to the uh, book of, where am I looking at? Joshua. Y'all know Joshua, right? I, uh, you know, I said earlier, I'm I'm honored to be here and to share with you guys um, what God's done in my life and what he's done in our ministry and what he's done just for us as as a group. But I thought this afternoon what I would do is, uh, because it really exhausted me to do all the stuff that I had to do to find some of the stuff I had. And I had so much more stuff I was going to give you, but you're not ready for it yet. So maybe some other time down the road. But I'm getting older. I, uh, I turned 76 in January the 10th, last, gen, last month. And, you know, we have no guarantees we'll be here today, whether we're 70 or 16 or 10. No guarantees. So I don't know if I'll ever get back here again. I mean, I don't, not that I don't want to come back again, but uh, I may never get a chance to share with you again. But I thought I'd, I would leave you with something today that I hope will help you uh, think about your legacy and your future. And Joshua is one of my heroes. One of my life's, actually two verses, is Joshua 1, 8, and 9. And uh, God laid those on my heart before I left New York, my gosh, 45 years ago, and went out to the desert of Nevada and planted a church and a mortuary, uh, not knowing what God was going to do, when he was going to do it, and how he was going to do it, and how he was going to fund it. But I just knew that he would. I shared, I think, a few years ago when I was back speaking in the men's group that For every vision God gives you, there's provision, if it's God's vision. If it's your vision, good luck. Uh, And I don't believe in luck, frankly. (laughs) But Joshua has been a a hero to me in my life and and, uh, a man that I admire uh, because he was always in the shadows of Moses. I mean, how would you like to be his understudy? I mean, you know, that's like trying to follow uh, Jesus, you know. Okay, take over, Peter. Well, good luck with that one, too. But Joshua is... Uh, an old soldier now in chapter 23 and he's getting ready to die in chapter 23 verse number one it says and it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all the enemies round about them that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age and age has a tendency of doing that to us does it not it uh, we feel stricken uh, it's like we get knocked down but this verse tells us that the condition of Israel at this time is good. They're where they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to do with the right people in the right place at the right time. In other words, Israel is finally at its purpose from where it started. And it's a place that God can bless. And what I want to share with you today is a few thoughts about Joshua, the old soldier who's getting ready to check out that he was concerned about what was going to happen afterward. I know uh, I'm mentoring a young man. He's 40 years old, um, 40 years old to kind of not take my place, but to step into the position, and I'm going to take a side step, step and become like the executive pastor or something. I don't know. I, I just can't retire. I have nothing to retire to. I don't have any real weeds in my yard. I have a few, and I would think I would run out of pulling those after a while. So I'm not looking to go sit around watching Netflix till my fingers wear out, you know, running the remote. But I, I'm concerned about legacy because what I see in the world today is there are a lot of what I call wimpy Christians. They're mediocre. They're not committed. They're not all in, but they sure want to go to heaven and enjoy the benefits of being a child of God. And I'm concerned about that for the future of the church because the numbers are declining in rapid pace. Pastors are quitting. A lot of them aren't really pastors anyway. They're just guys who found a nice job that they liked, that they were helping people, and that's wonderful. But the numbers are going down. They're declining. The numbers of people that believe in Christ, the number of preachers that still believe in the deity of Jesus Christ are, are, are like 50%. And these are evangelical people. Uh, with this woke society that we've got, it's attacked the church, it's trying to destroy everything that the Lord's built. I mean, we know that the church is going to stand because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
And you are the church. He's not talking about the building. He's talking about the people. So God's people have to learn how to prevail. And Joshua, what I love about Joshua is Joshua lays it right on the line. This is a strong man. This is a man who's been through a lot. And as a result of it, he had to wait 40 years because of unbelief of other people. I shared that with the, the AM team yesterday is that sometimes it's the people you're around that are holding you back. And you need to be around the right people. You need to be hearing the right information, the right words that go into your heart. But in verse number one, it says that he's waxed old and was stricken in age and he's getting ready to go. But when he gets down to chapter 23, verse 14, he says this, and behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you and are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. So before he leaves, what he's doing is he's trying to remind them that you've got to continue doing what God has allowed us to do to this point. You've got to keep serving because there are kids down here that are going to not know anything about the struggles that we went through when we crossed the Jordan River coming into this land. They're not going to know what it's like to build a building some of you may be here now that you weren't around when this building was built and the other buildings were built and the playground was put in and the ball fields were put in. It was just a piece of dirt. And I know that. I have that at our place. We had literally in the desert, all you got is dirt, you know, and it's not really dirt. It's rocks. With, I had to use a jackhammer to drag, knock down six inches to get a p piece of PVC in so I could lay sod over the top of it and keep it from die, dying out. So it was literally a piece of dirt. And we laid blocks and we built those buildings ourselves and there were several million dollars now, and we have only had debt on our property for 18 months and 45 years. That's because, again, God took care of us. But there's kids and there's adults and kids 40 years old going into the restroom, sitting on toilets somebody else paid for. They're using toilet paper that somebody else paid for. They're enjoying the air conditioning that someone else paid for, the heat. They're sitting on chairs that someone else bought. And they won't appreciate it. This is part of the problem with our young generation today is they got too much given to them. You know, I remember wearing shoes when I was a young child. They had leather soles, but the stitching wore out, and the sole would flop around, and I had to put cardboard in the bottom to keep the rocks from coming through the holes because we had no money. Any, some of you older people know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I hated it when it rained because it would always go right through that cardboard to my sock. And it was just, it was just a, a hard time, and we had nothing. I had shared a bedroom with two other brothers. And you know what I'm talking about? Everybody wants their own room, their own iPad, their own phone, and all this stuff today, and everything costs so much more. And I'm not against the stuff. I'm against the attitude of why do I have it? I deserve this. This is a society that's an entitled society. And in the church, there's entitled people. That's why they have time to complain. When you break sweat and you uh, lose blood into a facility or a, a ministry, uh, it's a little different. When you've got skin in the game, it counts. And so I'm concerned that uh, and I shared this with our people, oh, my gosh, a couple of years ago. And I was just praying about what to talk about. And, and the Lord just laid this one on my heart a couple of weeks ago. And I said, I just want to kind of leave a legacy, a thought of legacy. And I want to use Joshua to do it. Because before he leaves town, he calls the elders together in chapter 22 verse, or 23, verse 2. It says, And Joshua called all of Israel for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. So he said the same thing to them, but he's going to get the people together in chapter 24. So he's doing it the right way. You deal with the leadership. As the leadership goes, so go the people. If there's no leadership, they scatter. And so Joshua gets them together, and he tells them this is what's going to happen. And he's a faithful old soldier, and what he's trying to do is as he prepares, prepares to break camp, he wants to encourage them to stay the course. I think that's extremely important. Keep going. Have you ever seen that movie? Uh, I forget the name of it. But it's about the football team. It's a Christian film, Pure Flix. Does anybody remember the name of that movie? Where they're, what was the name of it? Facing the Giants. There's a clip in that movie where this heavier kid who's the tackle, I think, uh, has to walk on his hands with a guy on his back. And he thinks he's only got to go 10 yards. And he's down there pounding the, the dirt. Come on, you can go one more, one more. Come on, Josh. Come on, come on, come on, one more. And he goes all the way down to the end zone, 100 yards with this guy on his back. In other words, anyway, indicating he can do more than he ever thought he could do if he has the right encouragement. And so what God wants us to do is be encouraged. You younger guys, you older guys, we're going the way of the world. 
we're going the way of the earth. We're going to die if the Lord tarries. If, if, if we're still around here in another 10 years, I, I, I might be surprised. I might have to ask God to say, are you sure you got your timing right here? Because this world is going to hell faster than a speeding bullet. I, I've never seen so many things happen in my brief lifetime, but l- more so right down these last just couple, three years, these things have taken a turn. I mean, there's such hatred for anybody who has values. They have a hatred for Christians. They, they're... And if you don't have a, st- a leg to stand on, if you don't have a foundation to stand on, if you don't have the truth to stand on, they're going to buckle. And so Joshua gets these people together, and he starts talking to them, and he gives them some valuable lessons he doesn't want them to forget. Because when we forget, history repeats itself. Why do you think they tore the statues down three years ago? Well, okay, they had slaves, whatever. I want to remember someone had slaves. I want to remember that someone had victory. I want to remember somebody fought for what they believed in and was willing to die for. I want to understand that. That's an interesting study. But so many people, they just get it out of sight and forget about it. Well, you're doomed to repeat it. So what he does in his dying day, basically, is he prepares to leave. He does some things, that, and this is what I'm going to share with you. Number one is in chapter 23, verses 2 to 8. Joshua's concern for his people. Joshua is near the time he's going to leave, and he feels it's his duty to point out what they have, why they have it, and what they need to do with it before they, he goes. In verse number 6, actually, let's read verse number 2 down to verse number uh, 5, or for, 3 down to 5. And ye have seen all the Lord your God hath done unto these nations because of you. For it is the Lord, for the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. Behold, I have divided unto you all the lot, by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations I have cut off even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from, uh, from out of your sight and ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God had promised unto you. He's reiterating the word of God. I know that's what I love about Mark and and others. They keep pounding the word of God. You've got to have the word of God. It's got to be your foundation. It's got to be your rule of life. It's got to be your go-to everything. It's the answer for everything. As I said this morning, the word of God is the incarnate God that we can see and understand. And he walked around with these men for three and a half years, and many of those men missed exactly what he was trying to do. In fact, one time he said, how long will I have to suffer you? How long do I have to put up with you? He just wanted to smack him, but he has a heart for love. He knows it, what it's going to take to get the job done. That's why we do this job for as long as we've done it. Because it's not about you, it's about him and what he's trying to do in our lives. So he's fearful of complacency. Do you know people who are complacent in your church? You know people who are just there? You know what I'm talking about? They're just kind of in a daze. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know why they come. They're just in a habit. They're like an old trail horse. You know what a trail horse does? You get on a trail horse, and you think you're going to gallop with this horse, and you kick it, you do it, you slap it with the reins, and that sucker going away from the barn does not want to go at all. But boy, when you make that turn toward home, it's trot, 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 back to the old bin, right? That's what a lot of people are like. As soon as I get something that's going to make it easier or going to satisfy me, I get moving. But when it's something that is going to require me helping someone else, they slow down. That's why a lot of them are like that, because they get complacent. So he says, be therefore very courageous to keep, verse 6, and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right or to the left. Joshua is afraid that these people might go the wrong way. He's afraid they'll go backward. Have you ever gone backwards? You ever started out running a race and all of a sudden you go, you get, oh, there's a squirrel and I get over there and I get over here and I do this and all this gets up and I get busy and I stop reading my Bible, I stop praying, I stop serving and all of a sudden I can't figure out why I feel awful. Complacency. Forgetting the word of God. Forgetting what you've been commanded. It's my conviction that sin of complacency is one of the most common sins among the people of God. I did a sermon a while back, and I entitled it, Good Enough. Did you ever hear that phrase? Well, that's good enough. God never said good enough. He just said it's good. It's good enough for him. That's good enough for me. But people settle settle for good enough. Well, I read a couple chapters this week. That's good enough. 
I gave two bucks. That's good enough. I prayed once in a while. I, I might, if I get enough opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus Christ, uh, that's good enough. I'm okay. I'm good enough. Well, good enough isn't what God's after. God's after excellence. God's after the best. We give him the best fruits of our labors. We give him the best of our life. This is the Laodicean church age. And good enough is the mantra of the Laodicean church. It's good enough. That's why the people of God got to do something different. You know, Laodicea, they had two systems of water that came in, one from a hot area and one from a cold area. But by the time it got to Laodicea, the hot had cooled down and the cool had warmed up. So when it got there and Jesus says, I'll spew out of my mouth, but I'd rather have you hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Lukewarm is the, is the pablum that's being drunk by Christians in America. It's like, I just want to be comfortable. I just want to have a good time. I just want to be happy. Isn't that what people say? I just want my kids to be happy. I just want my wife to be happy. I want my husband to be happy. I want my dog to be happy. And the pastors, a lot of times, I just want my people happy because if they're happy, they give and they come. But that isn't what life's about. Happiness is based on happenings. Joy is different. Joy is I can be smiling with tears streaming down my face. I can be happy in my heart because the Lord is my Savior. I can be happy because the Holy Spirit's living in my life and I have a pure, preserved Bible that I know God's Word for my, di- my life every single day. I can be really happy about that and I can be joyful about that because I don't have to worry about circumstances. I'm concerned about my joy and not being complacent. But boy, that Laodicean church ages. And you know, unfortunately, since about 1800, 1880, somewhere in that area, when the revised version came out, all of a sudden the church started to take a nosedive. Because all of a sudden, instead of commentating on the Bible by comparing Scripture with Scripture, they became critical commentators. This is the wrong word. This is a bad translation. This manuscript is wrong. Da, 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 da. And once you start criticizing the Word of God, the Bible says it's a two-edged sword. You start playing with something that's sharp on one side, it's sharp on the other side. You need to be careful. So that started happening, and boy, I'll tell you what, it started taking a nosedive. In the early days of this country, the gospel was going out freely. In the early days of the 18, 1900s, when the message was being preached by guys who would read their sermons, and men would stand there in the back, and they'd grab a hold of the pews because they felt like they were slipping off into hell. That was the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now we have to generate somehow the power of the Spirit of God. I often thought maybe we ought to put little batteries in the shockers in the bottom of the seats and zap them once in a while. Go, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, and zip, you know, you get a whoa. I think I felt it. I know what you're talking about, past, you know. So we don't want to get to the point where we're complacent. And also, he was concerned in verse number seven about compromise. Look at verse seven: that ye come not among the nations, uh, uh, nations these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them. Neither serve them nor bow yourselves unto them. That's a lot. He says, I'm concerned about compromise, that you watch out. That fear Joshua had was, could possess the people. Isn't that what's going on today? People are possessed by materialism. The very things that became our blessings have become our curse. The, the availability of information, the freedom to go and whatever, all the stuff we have. We have money. We have too much money, probably. I'm not saying get rid of it. I'm simply saying we have to be careful because success is a, is a ruination of America. Jesus said, listen, you know what? You to love me with your, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbors yourself. He said, all the law and the Psalms and the prophets hang on these two. You can't do that if you love yourself more than God. And you can't do that if you love yourself more than your neighbor. And you can't do that if you love yourself more than your wife or your husband. Or your girlfriend, or your whoever. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty-two says, "Abstain from the very appearance of evil." That very appearance of the possibility of being complacent and the very possibility of being full of compromise. He says, "Watch out for that." In verse number eight, he talks about a third thing. He talks about a commitment, but cleave unto the Lord your God as ye have done unto this day. So at this point. In chapter 23, Josh was saying these people have stuck close to God. That's what cleave means, to be almost inseparable. When a man marries a woman, he's supposed to leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, which means stuck together so they're hardly inseparable. 
So he says, listen, you got to be careful because you're going to slack off, you're going to get easy, and you're going to watch out because there's other gods hanging out there trying to get into your heart and your life. If you notice that, we call that temptation. By the way, temptation is not sin. It's yielding to the temptation. But if it's rolling around in your brain a lot and you're seeing a lot, guess what? You keep looking over the fence, you'll probably go over the fence someday. If you keep looking at that, those naked pictures, pretty soon you're going to be wanting somebody that's naked. You know what I'm saying? Do you know that pornography is the number one addiction in America now? Amongst women as well as men? You wouldn't think a woman would do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're actually doing, at, at uh, several of the rehab places, they're actually doing counseling and therapy for people who are addicted to pornography. And it is a big one amongst Christians. You wouldn't think, but it is. Unfortunately, there's a lot of pastors that are addicted to pornography as well. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, 38, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not up his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Those were two things he said. You've got to love me more than all your relationships, and you have to take up your cross and follow me. Now, who wants to do that? Can you imagine the preacher says, hey, come on down here. Here, I got this Christianity, this religion down here. And you know what happens? If you come on down here, you got to get nailed to a cross. You got to love God more than you love anything else in this world. When you got Joel Osteen out there inviting you to come down and get your hair done and get yourself fixed up and just pray a little prayer and everybody's okay. That's the message that's going out. Your message of sacrifice, your message of surrender, your message of all in, your message of the glory of God, not the glory of man, is not a popular message in the 21st century. In fact, it's getting less popular all the time. More and more people are ducking out and disappearing. Joshua had some concern, but Joshua also has a challenge in chapter 23, verses 9, all the way through chapter 24, verse 24. And this part, part, Joshua challenges the elders to observe certain truths concerning God. His challenge for them is to look at what the Lord has done. You know, I, I, I think this is an important thing to do. It's to look at your history of your life and see how God has worked in your life every step of the way. Look back. You know, we have albums uh, go back when you got married or you had your babies or you got a new job or you got your new house or a new car, whatever, trips, vacations, and you look back at those and you reminisce. And you, th- you look at that and say, wow, that's great. One of the things I do like about Facebook is it's an avenue to reach people. But secondly, every once in a while, it pops up with some pictures of my memories. And my little granddaughter, uh, the youngest granddaughter, was turned uh, 12 years old uh, today, the, two days ago. And so a memory popped up, which made a video out of it. And I sent it to all my family, including my, my granddaughter. And they just loved it. They said, oh, this is so sweet. This is so sweet. I love those things. But I have to love God more than them. I can't see God. I don't audibly hear him. I can't feel him. But I'm supposed to love an invisible thing. That's why the Logos is so important. Because as I read through this, those words go into my head and come into my heart, and then they come out into my life. So I can love them, but I don't have to love them more than I love God. It's an important thing. So the challenge is he wants to make sure that they observe to look and watch and stay steadfast with the Lord. One of the things that we have, if we've been in ministry for more than 10 years, is the people that come and go. It's like there's a revolving door out in the back. They come in, hey, I'll be here. What can I do? And then they start doing something, and then pretty soon they miss once, and then twice, and then three times, and then four times. And you go, where'd they go? What happened to them? I don't know. We try to follow up on some people. I had one man. I sent 31 text messages and left phone messages for him to call me. He was gone for six years. He came back. He knocked on my door one night about 11 o'clock. I don't even know how he got through the gate, to be honest with you. He knocked on the door, and I didn't even recognize him. He lost a lot of weight. I mean, he wasn't a really huge man, but he was big. And he was perfectly in fit and shape. He said, I need to come back and apologize to you. I said, why? He said, well, the way I left, I didn't leave right. I want to serve the Lord. Can I come back? He's now teaching. What is it today, Sunday? No, tomorrow, Sunday. He's teaching my nine o'clock class tomorrow morning. You know what happens? When the man gets right, I'm going to help him stay right. 
I want to remind him to stay in the challenge, to stay in the fight. Hey, we all get knocked down. We all go down. But a righteous man falls seven, six times, but he rises up the seventh. He gets back up. The God of grace is a God who gives more than one chance. I mean, did you just, after you got saved, never had to go to God and say, hey, I messed up? <laughs> if you done, I, I need to talk to you. I need to find out how you did that. Because it seems like to me, I'm tripping and falling every day I walk, and I've got to be careful because there's always something coming to my obstacles in my life that if I don't watch, I'm going to stumble over it. But the challenge is we've got to observe the truths that God has, and it's the truth that makes us free, right? It's a force within itself. Someone says, set you free. Well, I don't like the word make is stronger. It's like there's a force making me free. He wants me to be free because when I'm free, that's where the Spirit of the Lord can roam and work in my life. And we all want the Spirit to do that. So in chapter 23, verses 9 to 16, he's considered, uh, he wants them to consider the wrath of God. Look at verse number 11. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that ye you love the Lord your God. That's the whole crux of the matter about staying faithful. I don't serve God because I'm waiting for him to smash me. I serve God because I get to. I was talking to one of the gentlemen here, I think this morning, and uh, we were talking about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, he has a job. Jesus said, after I go, he's going to come. He's not going to talk about himself. He's going to talk of me. But he's going to reprove the world of sin and righteousness. And I thought to myself, you know what? The Holy Spirit, when he comes, he's wanting to get sinners saved. So he's going to convict them of, of sin. Now, a lot of Christians think that's our license to convict you of your sin. But may I remind you, the moment you were born again, your sin was forgiven. All of your sins were forgiven, past, present, and future, in a relationship with God. Otherwise, you wouldn't be justified. And that's why God sanctifies you and sets you apart so that you can be housed by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's job is not to get you convicted of your sin. His job is to remind you of your righteousness. Mike, you're a son of God, not the son. You're a son of God. That's not what's becoming of a son of God. Why don't you change your attitude? Why don't you change your action? Instead of, Mike, you skunk, you rat, you, you screwed up, you messed up, you did this, you did that. That's not the Holy Spirit's job. He's trying to get you to remember who you are and whose you are. I tell you what, it's easy to go preaching about sin because usually when I'm preaching to you about your sin, I'm not preaching about mine. Do you know what I'm saying? That old deal, one finger out, there's three pointing back. He was about sin, let him cast the first stone. Isn't that something? And from the oldest to the youngest, they walked away when Jesus said that. <laughs> Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that you love the Lord God. Love is a verb. It's an action. It's not a feeling. You can get a feeling from love, but it's doing the right thing. That's why the church at Ephesus, when Jesus rebuked, rebuked them in the book of Revelation, he said, you've left your first love. You didn't lose it. You left it. You stopped doing the things that indicated you loved. If you never did anything kind for your wife or anybody else that you loved, and you said you loved them, would you think they might be confused as to what love is? Love is an action. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? God demonstrated something. That's why I love the, the New Testament, because Paul goes over there and he says, charity is the word, the same Greek word for love in John chapter 3, verse 16. Why did, the, why did the translators make it charity? Because charity is giving without having to receive. That's when you're grown up. That's, I call it mature love. But love, basic love, is I love you. I want you to love me back. God loved the world, gave his son, so you can love him back. You take an action toward him. You believe on him. Whoever believes on the name of the Lord of God shall be saved. Right? So Israel respond to the Lord was a perfect indicator to indicate their love for him. In chapter 23, verse 16, when you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods. <laughs> Joshua knew something about humanity, human nature, way back then. Serve other gods and bowed yourselves to them. Then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you. Now remember, they're under the law, not us. We're under grace doesn't mean the law is negated. That's a rule we're supposed to live by. But he said this, uh, when the uh, anger of the Lord is kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. 
He said, you will uh, perish. You're going to be gone. You're going to lose it all because you're not doing what I said. God's going to do that. That's the challenge that still applies to God's people today is the admonition is so simple. If you pay, play, you pay. People are coming to Vegas and they're putting, I, I see these people once in a while when I go in there for lunch or dinner and they're sitting there for hours. They can barely move and they're playing slot machines because they can't pull the arms anymore. They have buttons you push, but they leave the arms on there like it's the old days. And you, you don't hear the ding, ding, ding anymore. It's all electronic. And they sit there for hours and hours and hours playing these games. I've said so many times before, how do you think they built billion dollar buildings giving it all back to you? There's very few winners. Because they know human nature is I'm going to keep trying to win. This is what addiction is. I'm going to keep trying to get better, higher, whatever, more money. I'm going to get it back. I'll just put a little more in. And then they go broke. It's like the commercials at the Super Bowl or any game where they have a beer. Please drink responsibly. You don't care if I drink responsibly. You have to put it on there to appease your conscience or the code. They want you to drink as much as you can drink because they want as much money as they can get. That's the way of the world. That's why sin takes you farther than you want to go and leaves you in worse condition than you started. Come on down the yellow brick road. There's a septic tank down there at the end of the yellow brick road, man. Watch out where you're stepping. So the challenge for us is we need to apply our hearts to what God said and be obedient. Hebrews chapter 12, I love that chapter because it shows me there's four steps of discipline for God's believers in the New Testament. He gives you a word. He gives you a rod, he gives you a thorn, and you don't want to get to the fourth one, a knife. That's why the Bible says he gives you the word. A wise man hears the word or will hear correction and be wiser and do right. When you got to take some, a rod to somebody, they're past the point of learning to listen. And a wise man is now an unwise man because he's not listening. That's why an unwise person, wisdom is folly. It's a joke. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 and 7 talks about the church at Ephesus that had left its first love. In chapter 24 now, in verses 1 to 13, you need to consider God's works. He's talking to these people and telling them this section, Joshua reminds the nation of the great things that God has done. Is there great things God's done for you? You know, the moment I got saved, right? In fact, I'm going up to tomorrow after, after church. I'm going to go see my brother and sister live up about 200 miles north of here near Des Moines. I got born again at 109 College Avenue in an apartment on the first floor right off of 1st Avenue up in Ankeny, Iowa. Every time I go back there, which is usually once a year, I go by there and I take a picture of that house. It reminds me that's where I got born again. And my life changed forever in that little building down there. I wasn't in a church. I wasn't anywhere else. And I can remember what that bathroom looked like because I took the bathtub, or my Bible, and put it on the bathtub on the little edge, you know, before you get in the tub. And I went through the verses because I'd memorized the Romans Road the last six weeks before, 36 verses of Scripture. And man, it got on me like, like flies on a dead, ham, a dead uh, cow out in the road. And it was just going like crazy, crazy, crazy. So I memorized, I couldn't go to sleep. I got up and I said, because I knew in my heart, I said, God, if I died, I'm going to hell. I don't want to go to hell. I want to trust you. I don't want to just not go to hell, but I want to love you. I don't want to love you the way you want me to love you. And that night when I asked Christ to save me and I surrendered my life to him, I had a peace that I can't explain. I had a burden lifted off of my heart and I had a new purpose in my life and direction. Because in the meantime, I'd been kicking against the pricks like Saul had against why do you fight against me? There's no need to when I have life. Why do I keep getting stuck? So that night I got saved and I go by there every time and I take a picture. And the other day it scrolled up on my phone because I was there about this time last year. And it scrolled up on my phone and went, wow, I got to remember what happened, where it happened. I feel sad for folks who can't remember the date or the time, but that isn't, that's irrelevant because for centuries no one had birth certificates stamped by the county, right? I mean, you, know, you go back 500 years, 1,000 years, do you think they had birth certificates down to the county clerk's office or raised steel so you can get a driver's license? No. Your mother told you or somebody told you you were born in such and such a time, and so that became the legacy. Now I know when I was born again, I know where I was born again, and I know what I was born again to and from. And now I have a reason to go forward, but that's a reminder. That's like those ancient landmarks. Don't remove them because I want to remind myself that's where my life began. 
I go by the old hospital in the little town in Jacksonville, Illinois, where I was born. It was called Our Savior's Hospital. It's still standing, but the windows are busted out of it. They don't have the money in that town to tear it down. It's been sitting there since 1928. I was born in 1948, and I go by there, and I remember, well, I got my birth there, but I don't know anything about that, but I do remember my born again time. Look back on the benefits that God gave. That's a motivator. It's a motivator to when you think about my name's in the Lamb's book of life. That's an eternal book. My sins are gone as far as the east is from the west. That's a good thing. God put his Holy Spirit in me. He sealed me until the day of redemption. He promised me a home in heaven. He promised me a judgment seat. I don't want to go through it so much. I'm hoping you get to go first so he'll be all out of his judgment. And then I can step up and say, Mike, you did a pretty good job. Go on. Not as good as those guys. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm not looking forward to that. That's as close to hell as we're going to get, Christians. You better be ready. I want to be ready. But I got that. You got that. I got an opportunity for eternity to do something in the kingdom of God. I, I mean, I don't, that blows my mind. I mean, eternity blows my mind to begin with. I don't, I don't get it. You know, everything I see has got a period at the end of it. This is like a comma, 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 forever. And then it's not like going to be boring like reruns on TV. I think I've seen this show 85 times. I think I could recite the lines myself. Now, no, this is a whole new story God's got. It's life, eternal life with the Lord himself. That's something to think about. And God's done that for you. What did you do to deserve it? Nothing. He are saved by grace through faith that not of yourselves it is gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God saved you because he wanted you to be saved. And you chose to receive that. You need to be thankful for that and excited about it because that's a big work. To pass from death unto life is a big deal. Amen? The Lord works on our behalf. He's the motivator to serve. I serve him, hopefully tirelessly, because he gave all for me. I've got to give all for him. That's, only, that's due process. He did it. Now I need to give it back. Whatever you sow is what you reap. Whatever you give, God gives it back to you. That's the whole point of giving God love. He loves that. And he wants you to know you're loved. Not so you don't go to hell. I don't want God to be my fire escape, a fire escape out of hell. I want him to be my destination where I'm headed. I want him to be a part of that. Think of how he died on top of it. The perfect son of God who didn't do one thing wrong. Not one thing. They accused him all the time of stuff he did wrong. You know, you heal on the Sabbath and all that stuff. That was man's rules, not God's rules. And so he comes along and he dies. After being beaten and spit upon. And Pilate has the audacity. I think it was mostly with fear and trepidation. Do you know I have the power to release you? Jesus said... <laughs> I, I'm, I can almost see, after being beat, a little curly smile, like, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about, Dodo. You have no power except God gave it to you. And why? And he's God standing there saying that to him because he's the incarnate God in flesh that we talked about this morning. The word of God that made him is telling him he doesn't have any authority. I made you. And you're telling me you have authority? Boy, you talk about out of whack. This is our society today, 2,000 years later. Think about how he died, how he was buried. I don't know about you, but I always had this fear. I'm not really dead, so don't bury me. I had my uh, knee surgery done, uh, my knee replaced uh, last August, but the year before it, I had torn my, uh, my meniscus, so they had to do a surgery on it. So I was talking to the anesthesiologist, and we were just talk, chatting. She was a real nice gal. I've talked to her before, and we were talking about something. And she says, I'm going to put this in, and you're going to feel a little cold, and then you'll be out, and we'll take care of it. I said, Okay. So all of a sudden, that I started to feel the cold, and then I heard him talking. And I wanted to go, wait, don't cut me. I'm not asleep. And I said it out loud, apparently. And the girls who was there by the side, she said, oh, Mike, don't worry about it. You're in recovery. I said, oh, great. Thank you. It was just like that. I thought, oh, my gosh, you know what? I would hate to think about it being buried alive. I would hate to think about being cut like that intentionally and not being out. I think that's why they put us out anyway to do it. But you understand what I'm saying? It, it's like, I don't like pain. I'm allergic to pain. Aren't you? 
And Jesus went through all that pain and died and was, his body was stuck in a tomb. He goes down to hell according to the word of God. And then he comes and he leads captivity captive and he comes back up and he talks to a girl in the garden. Hey, worry, wait, wait, guess what, Mary? Master, Lord? Think of the love that he showed this girl who came down to the tomb. You know, she was much forgiven, so she was much thankful. When you realize what you have and what God went through to get to us, we should be thanking God every day for our salvation. You know, one of the things I practice and try to do very well uh, regularly is every time I pray is to pray, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. How can I thank him enough? If I thanked him 24 hours a day, seven days a week for my whole life, it wouldn't be enough for what he did for me. And then he says, Mike, not only am I going to forgive you and die for you like that, but I'm going to take you to heaven. I think we should consider his works. And then he gives me a Bible and preserves it and puts me in contact with people that teach me about the authority of the Word of God. I learned to study the Bible on my own because the pastor I was in for three years didn't even tell me how the difference between the Old and the New Testament. I learned diddly at that first church. And I got saved, not because of that church, but because of the Word of God. The Word of God changed my heart. God's trying to help us to understand and remember who he is. And then uh, I want you to consider God's will in chapter 24, verses 14 to 18. Joshua tells the people that it is the Lord's will for them to clean up their lives and to serve him faithfully for their whole life. He makes that statement so that the families that are serving him, in verse number 15 in chapter 24, he says this. He says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He says, I'm going to follow the will of God for my life. I'm going to follow the plan of God, the purpose of God in my life. He wants us to search our lives and make sure where we are in this, this life's journey that we're on with him. And he says, so if it seems evil to you, I, I don't know if you do this or not, but I've noticed people before that they just seem to feel like if I do this, it's the wrong thing, and it's a good thing. I'm trying to encourage them to pray and to read. I'm not pray harder because I don't know how you do that, but I mean maybe pray more sincerely or more frequently. I, I don't want people to, okay, I got to go serve more. I got to serve in everything and do everything. I got to be everything. No, no, that's not what he's talking about. I want us to get to a point where we feel like, hey, listen, I do this because I want to do this. Not I have to do this. When the offering plate comes by, is it like reluctance to drop in a few shekels? When there's a call for a special thing that has to be done, is there kind of a fear for that? I hope not. But there are some that will do that. They'll find excuses why not to give. But God says, I want you to follow through on what I'm doing. That's a great lesson when Joshua says to them, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, he's about to die. Easy for him to serve the Lord because he's only got a few days left, I guess. What the heck? You know, we might as well go out with a blast. But the sad fact is, of the matter is that not everyone is going to serve the Lord with total commitment like he did. That's the fact. I mean, you can mark it down. The old 80-20 rule, 80% of the people do nothing and 20% do. 80% of the people don't give, 20% do. Hopefully your statistics are higher. Ours are. We have about 60% of our people that give and serve. In fact, we had 80-some percent serving in some capacity one way or the other in our church for the last five years. That's a, it's unusual. We don't have a large church, but we have a good church, good-sized church, decent-sized church. It's because we try to teach them these principles. You've got to keep serving the Lord out of a pure heart and a heart of gratitude and thankfulness. And then what he tells them is in chapter 24, verses 19 to 24, to consider God's witness. Consider God's witness. Joshua makes a strange statement to the people in verse number 19 of chapter 24. And Joshua said to his people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, he is a jealous God, and he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. And what he's doing is his meaning is clear. He's reminding them the Lord's witnesses their lives, and they cannot have things both ways. You cannot serve God and serve mammon. You cannot serve God in the world. You cannot serve you and serve God at the same time. Does that make sense? Because it sounds like when he's saying that, it, you can't do this because you're unholy and he's holy and he's not going to forgive your sins. Well, he'll forgive you if you repent and do right. But you can't have it both ways. You cannot serve the Lord on one hand and serve a false God on the other. Does that make sense? 
Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. That's why it's important we cannot have it both ways. Either you're serving the Lord with absolute commit, commitment, or you're living a life of hypocrisy. No wonder people don't go to church is full of hypocrites. You can't be one thing at work and one thing at church, one thing singing in the praise team, and I'm not saying they are this way, and something else on Saturday night having a beer with guys out of the bar. It doesn't make any sense. It's kind of like you just can't have it both ways. We talked about this morning. If you straddle the fence, somebody's going to get hurt. Too many are trying to walk between the fence. Maybe no one will notice. God does. And after all, isn't that who we live for and die for and serve? In 1 Kings 18, 21, I love this verse. It says, And Elijah came upon all the people and said, How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal be God, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. There's a verse in Jeremiah 6, 16. I did a series a couple of years ago called uh, Your Ancient Future. And I used the idea that the verse says, uh, Choose you the old paths. And follow them. And God will take care of you and provide for you and bless you. But if you read Jeremiah 6.16, the last part of the verse says, we will not. And I use the idea because I remember that in Vegas, there's a Interstate 15 that runs from San Diego, I think down to Mexico, all the way up into Canada and past Canada, up to the Northwest Territory. Is there's a portion of that called the Old Santa Fe Trail. Do you ever hear of that one? In 1831, a man, uh, Antonio, uh, I think, Armillo, Armillo, took a mule train of 100 mules and 30 guys on a pack train from uh, Saint Santa Fe up around through Lake Powell in Arizona, back down by Las Vegas, basically going around the Colorado River, taking a trade route down. It was the old, like a train, a, a, like a choo-choo train, taking goods down to L.A. and then going to bring them back to Santa Fe. And then there was a Santa Fe trail that I think comes out to over here in Independence somewhere, part of it, right? And so he goes over there. So this particular year, there, there was not a lot of snowfall, so the Colorado River was low. So he cut 200 miles off of his trip, and he came to Vegas. And uh, if you looked up on the west side, there's a place where there's artesian wells, or used to be. That was the first original water supply in Las Vegas. And there were trees up there, and he saw it. So one day he was resting his mules for a day or so. And so he went up there, and he said, it's like the meadows. So he named it Las Vegas the Meadows, which is what that means, Las Vegas. And it still has its name today. But he came right down on uh, going toward, uh, in our area, toward Pahrump, uh, Nevada, which is over the, the southwest side of town. And you go around, it goes around, skirts around the Spring Mountain range of mountains where they go up about 12,000 feet. And then it turns and goes to become desert again. So that's the way the mule train would go. And so I found out there's a park on the west side of Las Vegas. I went and took some pictures and did a little research. And there's still actually some markings from an aerial photography of actual train, uh, whale, uh, wheel tracks from train or uh, trailer, uh, wagons, I guess, wagons, and then where the mules used to go down. And then they paved it, and it was Interstate 15. So I asked our people on the first Sunday, I said, how many of you drive off Interstate 15? Yeah. Do you know you drive on an ancient path? I said, you know what? It's a good path. It's still a good path. I said, let me challenge you to think about the ancient path of the Word of God, that there's some ways back here in the past that the Bible tells us about that we need to follow. And it's a really good admonition to think about that. There are people that have gone on before you, folks, that have pioneered the way. I mentioned that earlier, paid for stuff and built buildings and done stuff and programs that are going on, and you just come and get to enjoy it, right? So don't forget what God has done for you in that way. But he says this, and Elijah says to his people, he says, you don't choose who you're going to serve, who you're going to follow. So that was Joshua's concern, Joshua's challenge. And I want to finish up with Joshua's covenant. In chapter 24, verses 25 to 28, he makes a stone, he erects a stone. In chapter 24, verse 25, it says, or 24, And the people said unto Joshua, Lord our God, will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statue a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was uh, by the sanctuary of the Lord. So Joshua s sets up a, a stone, a monument. You know, in the Bible, there are many times when they crossed the Jordan, they took 12 stones out of the Jordan and 12 stones in to remind them that that's where they crossed. 
And that's a great picture because you're leaving the old world, the wilderness world, and you're going to the promised land. It's a picture of the spirit-filled life. It's ultimately a picture of heaven. You get out of this desert and you go into the promised land where God bless you. And so he says, remember these things. So he makes a stone statue, basically. He says, listen, this statue, this stone, every time you see it, it's going to remind you of the goodness of God. It's going to remind you whenever you pass by as a reminder what God has done for us in this nation. It's important to remember because we don't erect stones anymore or memorials, basically. We just don't. We might have a few pictures here and there, but we don't do that. But we do remember when we were saved. We do remember when this church was birthed and our church was birthed. We do remember when other churches we've helped sponsor that started. And we've helped start over five churches in different parts of the Western United States. And God has been so good to us by that. And I think I've shared this with you before, but I'll do it again because some of you may have heard it. When, when we planted our church in 1978, I just had laid on my heart that we need to give 10% of our entire income away to missions. And for the last 45 years, we've averaged over 20% of all of our income to missions. And you know why? Because we know what God wanted to do. And we knew if we didn't have to pay interest and money on debt, I didn't have to go ask the people for this and that and have an emergency like Jerry Falwell used to do. There's always a catastrophe going on and we need millions of dollars and blah, blah, blah. And you know what? God has blessed us with a debt-free property. We have money in the bank. And whenever someone needs money, we do it. We just sent $20,000 to a church up in Idaho that needed to get siding put on. Last year, we gave $60,000 to a missionary in India who needed it for a building over there. We've done, we sent $20,000 over to Africa years ago to pay for a, a, some kind of a Bible conference or whatever, it's a big one, to feed the people for the week. We, we have that kind of a heart because we don't want to forget what God gave to us. And by being faithful to that, God says, if you can remember me, I will remember you. If you're faithful with me, I'll be faithful with you. If you draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. So what stone do you have in your life to remind you of your journey of Christianity in your life? What stone or what monument have you raised up that reminds you, this is where I chose to stop going the way of the world and chose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I stopped doing this. I got victory over this, and now I'm at peace. I was struggling, and now I'm victorious. I still have tra- challenges, but I'm not defeated all the time. I was happy, but now I have joy. Those are things that we need to remember. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 to 5 says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou art upon the earth. Therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and fool's voice Voice is known by the multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Are you doing the things the Lord told you to do? You say, well, I don't know what he told me to do. What, have you read your Bible lately? Have you listened to any messages? Have you been around any brother believers? I love this event going on, the, the, these two sessions where we had where you sit down and we talked. It was great to hear you guys talk and listen to discussions and input and share struggles and how you got there. We had one of the points this morning where I just suggested, I said, okay, how do we do this? I said, well, you need an accountability partner. You need somebody you trust, somebody that can smack you in the face with love and you take it because you know they love you and they care for you. I have some men like that I know Brother Mark does as well. Some men that are in the ministry that understand what it's like. I mean, we're in a different category. I don't mean the higher category, even though we stand up here. We're in a category where we've got a target on our head. I mean, he's trying. If he can get the, the, the head to fall, the tail drops. If he can knock down the guy who's in charge, he's going to not have collateral damage with everybody else, isn't he? I mean, we've seen that with presidents, with senators, with congressmen, with athletes, Right? Oh, these are heroes, and then you find out they're scum. Or they find out that they did something really terribly bad. So are you doing what the Lord told you to do? Are you going where God wants you to go? Are you giving what God wants you to give? James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, it is sin. Well, let me close with this. Three gravestones. There are some gravestones 
There's three funerals actually here with some gravestones. The gravestones in chapter 24, verses 29 to 31, is the gravestone of faithfulness. That gravestone that Joshua rose up is a gravestone that reminds people that God is faithful to his word. God will always keep his word. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a good one, isn't it? How about that? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do you ever have tr- confusion about where should I go? What should I do? I get people all the time. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. How can I tell? I'm not God, but I can tell you how to find out. You've got to do what God wants you to do, but you've got to know what God wants you to know. Remember we talked about thoughts this morning, ideas, concepts, precepts. You've got to get some information coming in so your spirit can discern what needs to be done, and you've got to be obedient. If you're faithful over a few, God will give you more, but you've got to be faithful with what you've got. Joshua 24, 31, he says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that over, overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Those people outlived him, but they died off too. Then there's another generation coming along. You ever hear about a guy named Joseph in the Bible? Joseph was the man who saved the world because God put him in a pit by hatred, by sibling rivalry, which put him down into Egypt, which put him as a second in command, and he saved the whole known world, including Israel at that time. And he said, listen, don't don't leave my bones in Egypt. And he says, tear him off. And it was hundreds of years later before he got out of there. But, But they didn't know. And the Bible says a pharaoh arose that didn't know Joseph. So what happened, whatever Joseph's influence was in Egypt, went away. Whatever happens in your life when the people that are invested in you have taught you or shared with you leave, sometimes you don't remember what you're supposed to be doing. See, God has a part, you have a part. God won't do your part, and you can't do God's part. We do our part to teach and preach the Word of God so that you hear it, so that you now have to do your part. It's kind of like you like baseball, right? You have a stadium right down the road, and you know what they do? They Throw the ball, and the guy catches it. Then he throws the ball back to him, and then he throws it back in. And they pitch and catch, right? Back and forth, back and forth. Well, that's what the Bible says God wants you to do. I've done something. I've put you in. This is what I've done. I've saved you. Now I want you to follow me. Well, how do I follow you? By faith. Well, I don't know where I'm going. That's what faith is. Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldees not knowing where he was going to go. And look what we got today. Millions of people that have tried to exterminate the Jews are still here. You know, if I didn't know anything else about the Bible, I would believe the Bible because of the Jews. You can't get rid of them. Hitler tried six million of them, cooked them and everything else. Uh, the uh, Hamas and all these people hate the Jews right now. They're getting ready to start the World War III over there. They hate them. They hate them because they want what Abraham gave to Isaac, but they couldn't get it through Ishmael. What a place, man. What a place. What, you're living and I'm living in the best time of history. Hopefully we get to go, I've always wanted to say, beam me up, Scotty, but I'll just say, beam me up, Jesus. I always wanted, when I first watched that Star Trek years ago, I liked that. Off you go. I don't, my problem is my foot would probably come back on my head when they reorganize all the molecules. You know, it's, we need new tech. I'm going to wait for the new technology before that happens for me, I hope. So he says, the elders that outlived Joshua, who had known the works, how did they know the works? Not only did they see them, but they were reminded of them by Joshua. Uh, I am the CRO, my secretary told me at church. I said, what does that mean? The chief reminding officer. Our job is to remind you. Peter says, I want to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Remembering what? What you already know. That's what exhortation is. We're trying to exhort you to read and pray and be faithful and love God and serve God with all your heart and bear your own cross and, and surrender to God. That's a reminder. That's all we do. So there was the gravestone of faithfulness because of Joshua. There's also the gravestone of fulfillment. Joseph got his answer to his prayer and request to his people because in Joshua, uh, Genesis chapter 50, when he left, they took his bones with him. The lesson is really good here because if you serve God, who is able to make that which seems impossible a reality, Joseph's bones laid there in Egypt, embalmed in Egypt for a long time before he got to the promised land. 
but he got there. He had nothing to do with it. This is what God will do. He will do stuff in your life if you're totally surrendered and you're totally used by God and available to God. He'll put you in a position to have maybe somebody else fulfill that promise for you. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. See, he made the promise. If he made it, he's good. And then the last gravestone is the gravestone of finality. That's the last grave marker. And it's of Eleazar in uh, chapter 24, verse 33. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died. And they buried him in a hill that pertaineth to Phinehas, his son, which he gave unto him in Mount Ephraim. Aaron is the last, well, the son of Aaron who was with Moses. So all the old guard is gone. The priestly line, the leadership line is gone. The changing of the guard, the old timers are gone. Someday here they will be gone. In 2 Kings chapter 12, or chapter 2, verse 12 and 14, Elijah and Elisha, you know the story. It says, And Elisha saw him, and he cried, Father, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent him in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan and took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? When he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither and, as, and Elisha went over. Elisha was told by Elijah, if you're around me when I go, you're going to get that double portion that you wanted. Wouldn't it be cool? Not that Mark's leaving soon. But whoever takes over, whoever in your life influences you, has a double portion of whatever. You know what they're going to do? They're going to show you how the power of God works. I'm praying that there's some Elishas in this crowd for 2024. I'm praying that in our church, that there'll be some men that'll say, I want a double portion of that. Not so I have pride and I have arrogance, but because I have what God wants me to have. Can we do that? Is there some Elijahs in the crowd? I sure think there are. I know there'll be some more that were here if they're going out of town or traveling or whatever, but stand up and be counted for God. Be in the place for your pastor and help him. Help this ministry have an influence in this community like never before. The mega churches are doing all right, but leave them alone. Don't worry about them. You got your own field here that's cut out for you. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, I'm going to thank you again for just your grace and your mercy. Lord, thank you for allowing me to share today with these men the great things that you've done in my life and the things that you're going to do in their lives. Lord, I pray you would truly raise up some men like Elisha that would say, Lord, use me. Some men like Joseph, some men like Joshua who are all in because of your glory and your kingdom and your purpose and your plan for our lives. And Lord, we'll thank you for it because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Mark.